Previously in Nomi Factory Community Edition Unofficial Edition 1.4.1 Edition. I had created technology capable of harvesting resources in an alternate universe. Unfortunately this Earth base was getting rather crowded for my future plans. But what location in the universe could possibly have infinite space in all directions? The universe. I could theoretically launch a space station millions of blocks away from this planet, which would contain several life support systems and infrastructure beyond mortal comprehension. But getting a space station would be easier said, than done. The first order of business is to deal with the massive amounts of ores that were piling up. Theoretically I could simply smelt all of them to get various ingots, but this was a waste of the ores true potential. Because by using machines, not only could I extract more than double the usual material from ores, but I would get profuse amounts of different byproducts ranging from rare earth to radioactive materials. Theoretically with enough machines I could get 3 iron from 1 iron ore as well as the byproducts of gold and nickel. But iron ore is boring. The multiverse mining mission had given me Elmanite, which could give a byproduct of rudeal, which will give a byproduct of titanium, which is an ingredient of extreme voltage machinery, which gives a byproduct of gaming. After doing a bit of literature analysis, it appears that for the best ore processing results, I would need one macerator, one ore washing machine, one thermal centrifuge, and yet another macerator. I would also need packing machines to turn the tiny dusts into normal dusts. So after using the auto crafting system to formulate me some high voltage machine parts and machine hulls, I created all of the ore processing machines at high voltage tier, which would give me a quadruple speed boost for processing everything. The next step is to connect all the machines together. In this corner of the base I concocted a new high voltage power grid connected to some high voltage cables. The first machine to process ores is the macerator to crush ores into the crushed version of ores. That was when everything went wrong. Because each ore gives stone dust and some random byproduct as well when they are pulverized. The next ore processing step was the ore washer, but it only worked on crushed ores. Meaning I would have to somehow filter out all of this random garbage. But how? A normal filter had only 5 slots. And processing all these different ores gave Grand Gold you dig zig on amounts of byproducts. I was about to call 911 for assistance when I discovered the object known as the Ore Dictionary Filter, made of some basic metal parts. This aforementioned filter can sort objects based on what words are in the item's name. Meaning I could use this to extract all items that have the word crushed in its name. The stone dust was sorted into this garbage can to violate the conservation of mass, and the random byproduct was sent to this storage drawer wall. Anyways the ore washer turned the crushed ores into purified objects, with a tiny dust byproduct and more useless stone dust. The tiny dusts were sent into the packager to be turned into normal dust, and the stone was forced to mysteriously disappear. The purified objects were then extracted with another or dictionary filter to be propelled into the thermal centrifuge, causing the formation of centrifuge doors and even more tiny dust. In the final step the centrifuged aggregates were pounded into even more dust and byproduct dust. All of these dusts and packaged dusts are then suctioned into the drawer wall. This entire system should be able to extract massive amounts of rudeal from ilmenite. To test this hypothesis, I deposited the Omanite into the beginning of the ore torture chamber, and waited for the results to materialize. And they did. The amounts of Rudy I got were, for a lack of a better word, false affian. I also received a myriad of Omanite, which could be processed further into actually useful Rudio, and a byproduct of iron. But the ore processing journey was not over. There are two types of ores ores, and gem ores. For gem ores, instead of using a thermal centrifuge, the crushed materials could be redirected into a sifting machine to extract several different tiers of gems, ranging from not even a gem, to exquisite shiny perfect circle gem. But looks can be misleading. This is not dust. This is actually purified dust, which can be centrifuged for even more dust. So according to my calculations, 
sifting was more effective for raw materials than the normal route. To turn this sifting dream into a reality, I created several more high voltage or processing machines and attached them to the power grid. I then connected it all together using some more item pipes and or dictionary filters. The idea is to have the system put gem ores in the sifting machine rather than in the funny hot spinning machine. To do this, I simply added a normal item filter and told it the specific gem ores to accept. And I made this item pipe priority number one. Meaning that instead of going straight into the thermal centrifuge, all the ores will first be checked at the high priority item filter. And any ore that does not match the accepted items will be denied from the sifting machine, and sent into low priority hot spinning centrifuge land. The first gem ore to test with this was salt ore. The salt ore could be sifted for salty gems that could be pulverized to get even more salt, amounting to ridiculous amounts of salt. This would also give byproducts of rock salt and borax, which are sources of the mouth-watering boron and potassium elements. A fine addition to my growing material collection, which shall be used for when I would need more advanced alloys eventually. All of the salt I was getting could then be electrolyzed for sodium that nobody cares about and chlorine that someone cares about because I needed it for ridiculous amounts of hydrochloric acid eventually. So this salt will help me survive the storm. And now that I had Bruteal, I could use it to get titanium. There is just one problem. Doing this needed the troll process. Just one letter away from troll. This was indeed a massive troll because to get titanium, I would need to react the Bruteal to get titanium tetrachloride which is blasted with magnesium at extremely high temperatures for hot titanium, which has to be cooled in this Kerulean regular parallel pipette, to yield titanium. All of this needed advanced vacuum freezing technology and advanced blast furnace technology, which also needed advanced vacuum freezing technology. Which is not even realistic. But enough complaining. Actually it was time to complain about one more thing. Doing all of this titanium process consumed massive amounts of energy. Since each blast furnace and vacuum freezer would be running at the same time, supporting every titanium processing machine needed the beefiest power system possible. This theoretical beefy power system would be comprised of the highest possible amperage energy converter, and high voltage batteries to go along with it. Unfortunately, lithium batteries were getting boring. The real deal were these communism colored two dimensional rhombohedrons, called energium crystals. Made from a mix of redstone and ruby dust, cooked in a boiling pot of molten blue steel. And making blue steel needed steel and rose gold and brass and black steel from copper and gold and zinc and copper and silver and gold and copper and coal and void crystal and red coal and coal. But do not fear because I had all of the materials I needed due to the deep mob learning resource farm, meaning all I had to do was just mix everything together. After patiently waiting for crystals to cook, I now had all of the batteries to make a 16 amp high voltage power grid. Now that I had the power system I needed, it is time to fabricate the actual blast furnaces themselves. Note: Plural blast furnaces because from now on I would need massive amounts of blast furnaces to deal with the levels of mandatory blast smelting that is present in the late game. Previously, making a single blast furnace manually was a 7.5 on the pain scale. But with the matter energy system, I could create patterns to auto-craft the blast furnace parts automatically. Meaning I could mass produce the machines needed to mass produce materials. Not only is mass production of mass production rather humorous, it is necessary from now on. So I got to work making patterns for making blast furnace coils, which I then used to create auto craft enough coils for three blast furnaces. To go along with this I also made variegated amounts of heat proof casings, input and output hatches, and blast furnace controllers. After all of the blast furnaces were created, here is the blasting plan. The one I already had would still be used for automatically creating common alloys such as stainless steel. A new one would be used specifically for making titanium. A third blast furnace would be adjacent to the titanium maker, for blasting spare ilmenite dust into rudial dust. The only thing left to do was to devise the vacuum freezer, which is the only way to refrigerate hot titanium into normal titanium. Disclaimer. 
The second law of thermodynamics is egregiously non-existent. Hot ingots do not automatically cool down because need to be forcefully cooled. Also for some reason the vacuum freezer needed extreme voltage circuits even though all it did was refrigerate. Meaning this refrigerator was basically a NASA supercomputer with more computing power than this entire base combined. But no questions asked. The only extreme voltage circuit I could make at the moment was the workstation, which needed to be made in a clean room, and also consumed high voltage circuits. Fortunately I possessed both of those objects already due to the events of episode 6, so making the workstation was rather easy. Now all I had to do was conjoin the workstations with some machine parts to generate the vacuum freezer controller. The vacuum freezer multi-block also needed approximately 20 aluminum machine casings. If only I magically had hundreds of spare aluminum ingots randomly laying around. Which I already had. Once again all I had to do was put them in the metal working machines to amalgamate the aluminum integuments. With cooked energium crystal, refrigerator NASA supercomputers, and mass produced blast furnaces, it was now time to actually build the blast furnaces and vacuum freezers. The first thing I shall create with this industrial blasting complex is the infamous canthal ingot. In reality, canthal is a trademarked alloy created by Hans von Kantzau and Halstall Hammer Sweden, with resistivity 1.4 microohms meter and temperature coefficient 49 millionths per Kelvin. In Greg Tech, canthal is the base material for the second tier of blast furnace coils. The self-explanatory canthal coil with a maximum heating temperature hundreds above the current cupro nickel coils, allowing me to smelt tens of new materials, including titanium and nichrome. Using some nickel, iron, and chrome from redstone, I hobnobbed a few stacks of the canthal, which I threw inside the blast furnace. This would create hot canthal ingots, which would have to be escorted into the vacuum freezer. The bad news is that touching hot ingots led to a slow and painful death. So I would use an item pipe to safely transfer hot materials into the vacuum freezer, using a filter that only accepted ingots with the word hot in its name. This is so that normal ingots that don't have to be cooled will not be sent into the vacuum freezer, which will do absolutely nothing useful. The cooled ingots would then be chaperoned into the matter energy system, through this interface. Since smelting all this cantha would take hours, I decided to do something else in the meantime. And what better thing to do, than to scrutinize the processing of rutium. The first step is that rutil is reacted with carbon and chloride to create titanium tetrachloride and carbon monoxide. This titanium chloride is then blast smelted with magnesium in a canthal air furnace or magnesium chloride and hot titanium. Immediately I had a spiritual awakening. All the magnesium chloride and carbon monoxide could be electrolyzed to return 100% of the chlorine and carbon, meaning that they were fully recyclable. The only input that was truly consumed was rutile. To do all of this I would need two high voltage electrolysis machines and one high voltage chemical reactor. I then placed it next to the titanium cookers, and connected everything together with the appropriate item and fluid filters. The oxygen part of the carbon monoxide would be exiled into a garbage can, while the magnesium from magnesium chloride would be immigrated into the blast furnace to cook more titanium tetrachloride. And it looks like all of the canthal has been barbecued and refrigerated. I used the newfound canthal along with some other metallic materials to manufacture the canthal coils. Meaning that the cupro nickel coils were out of business, being resigned to the arc furnace to meet a very slow and painful death, of being recycled. But the cantho coils were not safe either. Because the only objective of the cantho coils existence was to smelt nichrom for the nichrom coils, which would instantaneously supersede cantho. So I used even more chrome and nickel to mix two stacks of nichrome, which I rapidly propelled into the fiery furnace. After doing some calculations, it appeared I would have to wait one hour for all of it to be processed. So in the meantime I would focus on setting up the processing of ilmenite. Apparently, smelting ilmenite with carbon will give rutile, 
iron, and carbon dioxide. So what I did was connect the blast furnace to the ME system to automatically import carbon and dilmonite, and connected this trash can to the furnace to destroy all the useless carbon dioxide, while the iron was embezzled towards the ME system. The rutio would go straight into the titanium tetrachloride chemical reactor, which will begin the production of titanium. I also added in a beginning amount of chlorine and some magnesium byproducts I obtained from more processing. At around the same time I received enough nichrom to make the nichrome coils, which replaced the cantho coils, which replaced the cupronickel coils. Making cupronickel tonight's biggest loser. The punishment, is being recycled out of existence. Anyways I underestimated the power of the nichrome coils. Since this coil was a few thousand degrees more powerful than cupronickel, it would give a double speed boost to all smelting processes that needed a lower temperature. In the past aluminum took 15 seconds to smelt with a noob furnace. But with an extreme voltage nichrome super extreme overclock electric blast furnace revamp remaster, it took 2 seconds. And after starting the titanium production with some rudio, the system I created actually worked without catastrophic disaster. But titanium is not the only thing needed for extreme voltage machinery. I would also need extreme voltage machine parts and even more workstations. And this would need new materials such as platinum and neodymium. Meanwhile, in the ore processing sector, the redstone ore was crushed and washed in Agnetist centrifuged to get this rare earth powder byproduct. This rare earth can then be centrifuged further for the funny rare elements such as cerium, yttrium, blah 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 and neodymium. This neodymium dust is then blast smelted and cooled and magnetized in a polarizer to become magnetic neodymium. The nickel ore is then processed to get a byproduct of platinum, which I needed not only for extreme voltage components, but also for making more diodes for workstations. Speaking of circuitry, instead of using silicon pool like a normal person, I sprinkled several glowstone above several silicon to create the glowstone doped silicon pool, which were far more effective for producing electronic parts. In the meantime I now had hundreds of titanium ingots, allowing me to initiate phase 2 of Operation Gaming. I began making patterns for all the extreme voltage related items so that the ME system could auto-craft them. Everything from aluminum cables to extreme voltage machine hulls to extreme voltage circuits to extreme voltage machine parts, was now immortalized in funny patterns. Now that I could order them on demand, I ordered them on demand. I then invented the extreme voltage wire mill and alloy smelter, since those were the most used machines in my factory. These machines worked four times as rapidly as measly medium voltage technology which was promptly exiled from the IGO by lots of names community, never to be seen again. The extreme voltage machines worked so fast that when I ordered one item, I attempted to see them in action, but it was already done. The devil was in awe and shock. But I wasn't done yet. Now that I had titanium and extreme voltage machinery, it was time to create the space station assembler, so I could finally launch my space station. There is just one major catastrophic issue in the way. As we can see here I needed the extreme voltage sensor. Which supposedly needs a quantum eyeball. This is made by dipping eyes of ender in poisonous radioactive gas known as radon. And I had no radon. There were three ways I could use to acquire this element. The first one is using hyper advanced fusion technology. Secondly I could use plutonium to turn uranium into radon. And third of all, I could magically obtain it from radium salt. All of these were preposterously expensive but I was forced to resort to radium salt. Which only originates from the microverse. Luckily I had that. Unluckily I needed a tier 2 micro miner to be able to harvest the radium salt. Unluckily this needed titanium. Luckily I had titanium. Unluckily the tier 2 micro miner consumed extreme voltage. Unluckily this meant I had to upgrade the microverse to use an extreme voltage input hatch. Unluckily this meant, a lot of things. Unluckily this included upgrading the electronics factory to handle processing extreme voltage deer stuff. Luckily, I will stop talking and start gaming. 
First I shall expand the clean room with my latest installment of classic concrete and filter vents, made from my massive backup stash of smelted materials and thousands of plastic. I then use the workstations to create the high voltage circuit assembler, which would replace the medium voltage version. But then, disaster struck. Since both looked similar, I accidentally placed the original assembler on the high voltage power grid, leading to an electrical overload explosion annihilation nuclear super catastrophe. Nothing was destroyed however. So I pretended nothing happened and set up the new circuit assembler. Speaking of assemblers, I use more extreme voltage thingies to create the extreme voltage assembling machine and cutting machine, both of which are needed for the extreme voltage energy hatch. The extreme cutting machine was for some reason the only thing powerful enough to do the simple task of slicing the power integrated circuit, and engraving it in the first place needed brown lenses, which needed brown chemical dye. I thought then getting something brown would be easy. But then I realized. The search for the brown dye was basically impossible. The existence of jungles in this world was non-existent, meaning cocoa beans were non-existent. The other brown dyes also needed brown dyes to make in the first place. That was until I found the existence of the metal mixture dust, which apparently counts as a brown dye. And this dust simply comes from centrifuging stone. Brown dye was possible after all, and a heart attack was prevented by this information. Anyways the brown lens was created, the power integrated circuit was born, and the power IC wafers were lacerated. The extreme assembling machine then conjoined everything together to make the extreme voltage energy hatch. Now I could focus on getting the tier 2 micro minor itself. It needed all of the parts that were seen in the tier 1 minor. The main difference is this needed titanium plating, which I already had a lot of. After ordering more parts from the auto crafting system and doing several more instances of left clicking and right clicking, I left clicked the tier 2 miner into existence. I then did some more clicking to get the miner into the microverse, and I then did the action known as waiting, to time travel to the future where the miner had completed its mission and returned with radium salt. This also returned with shaylite and tungstate, which were the main source of tungsten, which is the main source of insane voltage machinery, which is the main source of gaming. But we weren't there yet. I put the radium salt in an electrolyzer to split the compound into infamous toxic radon, which I then submerged with eyes of ender to make it obese and more purple, aka the quantum eyes. With the quantum eyes, platinum, and workstations, I left clicked the extreme voltage sensory equipment into existence. And with this, I could finally create the space station assembler. The culmination of the whole journey for titanium and radon. The first thing I did with this momentous achievement of technology, was turn a dirt block into a space station package, which was the bare minimum needed for a space station. To launch this space station, I would have to make a few upgrades to my rocket. I installed a rocket bay and an extra thruster to counter the added weight, so I could load the space station package onto the rocket. For the final preparations, I made more dislocators so that I could easily travel between Earth and the future space station. And I dumped some rocket fuel into this rocket. The final thing I needed for the final preparations, was to put on the space suit. That was when catastrophe struck. This space suit did not have the ability to make me fly, which only the glitch armor was capable of doing. But the glitch armor was not appropriate for enduring in space. The solution, was concocting the airtight enchantment. Four of these airtight books on my glitch armor would allow me to breathe oxygen in space. Now here's the plot twist. The four airtight books costed 36 Nomi dollars. So far my only source of Nomi coins was completing quests, and all of these so far only amounted to a few dollars, which is less than 100% of 36 Nomi dollars. How could I possibly hope to earn the ridiculous amounts of money to buy this? I took several dream high IQ pills, and in the resulting hallucinogenic dream, in the first page of the quest book, you shall find an old friend, a board run by crooks, to help you meet ends. This board is filled with bounties, requesting random stuff. Each bounty shall give pennies, until you shall have enough. 
When I woke up from this prophecy, I immediately created the bounty board, which was filled with easy quests that would give massive amounts of money as a reward. Never before was it this easy to trade with imaginary voices for imaginary wealth. The only things I needed to sell were low voltage machine parts and these things called widgets, which were mostly made out of wood, stone, and primitive materials fit for a peasant. All of which I had practically infinite amounts of due to all the resource farms I had been running over the past six episodes. So I gladly accepted this task. The main problem was all of these had very short time limits, so I would have to hurry on each quest. Luckily I could use the auto crafting system to automatically create gadgets on demand without manually going through all these steps. The stone and wood widgets would have to be made manually however, since they needed hand tools. With this power combination of widget automation, machine part crafting on demand, and handcrafted homemade devices, I began selling to buyers on a massive scale, and receiving coins on a massiver scale. I had filled tens of customer shipping demands with ease. And the best part is that all of the new incoming bounties were as easy as the old ones, so I could theoretically continue this for the rest of eternity for replacement and accessible infinity wealth. But after half an hour, I already had enough Nomi dollars to buy all of the airtight enchantments. Now it was time to do a quality assurance test. I smashed the books onto my clothes for optimal airtight experience. Next I actually launched the rocket to deploy the space station. And I confirmed that the dirt block had successfully been deployed to space. And I confirmed that I could indeed fly around in space while simultaneously not dying a gruesome death in space. Now that I had a space station and I did not die on the space station and I could fly while not dying, it is time to actually do something with the space station. I set up dislocators to connect the space station to the surface of the planet known as Earth. The plan, was to move the entire Earth base to outer space. Here's why. The current base had various design flaws. As I continue progressing in the game, I would have to upgrade and expand several sections of the base, such as the microverse, clean room, and chemistry area. But the positions of the different sections of my base didn't allow for expanding them so easily. If I relocated to outer space, not only could I use this as a chance to redesign everything, but I would have infinite room to expand left right forward backward up down past future present and 5 dimensional orthogonic multiversal travel. The plan for the new space space is that it would have several floors. Each floor would have 4 quadrants dedicated to a specific task such as ore processing or oil refining. Each quadrant would have infinite room to expand on two sides, and each quadrant would be connected to one center, which would also have a main power line and matter energy cables running through it. This plan was genius. But moving the Earth base was no small task. And these measly hand tools were certainly unsuitable for destroying hundreds of blocks. So I would invest in electrical power tools, sponsored by Home Depot. First I cooked some more energium crystals, which I associated with some metal parts to create the power unit. I then fashioned some diamond drill parts and wrench dips, which were attached onto the power unit to create the power tool, which were charged by powering them with batteries stolen from the blast furnace complex. With these, I could now break objects at instantaneous velocity, all while having nearly zero impact on the tool's durability. I was now truly a home fixing testosterone pumped father with zero kids. Armed with a space station and power tools, I shall begin the mass migration of the Earth base, in the next episode. So shout out to the channel members of the past. If you wish to contribute whatever coding knowledge or scientific knowledge you have to Greg Tech Community Edition, then click on the links in the description.